Part two of our Kristaps Porzingis trade podcast. It's been a couple hours. Uh, Kyle and I have come back down to earth somewhat, I would say, over here. But we're also being joined by Brian Giberman now. What's going on, man? Did I miss something today? <laughs> oh, did you? Um, all right, this time before, because I, I was a little too sore to properly do it on the last one, um, you can follow me at Corbo Anthony on Twitter. You can follow Brian and Kyle, just their names with an app before it. It's real easy. Uh, you can follow the Knicks wall on Twitter. You can follow TKW podcast as well. Head to the YouTube channel. If you're listening there, hit the subscribe button, uh, head to the Knicks wall.com. You will see that our front page is littered with images of Chris South's Porzingis as much of our staff gets our uh, last words out about how we feel with the trade today that sent him to the Dallas Mavericks with Tim Hardaway Jr. with Courtney Lee and Trey Burke for, uh, for uh, Dennis Smith Jr., Wes Matthews, DeAndre Jordan, two first round picks. Brian Gaberman, you're, you're here. You're joining us now. It's the first time we're hearing from you. You've been off Twitter for most of today. What are your initial thoughts now to uh, Chris Hoss being in Dallas? So there's many angles to go from this. So I, I think I'm going to start with something just kind of short and quick. It's the how badly Phil Jackson screwed up is still reverberating through this organization. The off season where he went and traded for Rose and signed Noah instead of moving the process along and taking steps forward from where they were the year before and instead setting them back and then alienating Chris Stops and then the Knicks never being able to rebound from that, that I, there's still that that's the impact of this is still being felt to the, of what Phil Jackson did is still being felt today and will continue to be as Noah is still on the books and costing them cap space, even though they now have plenty of cap space. And and can I just add to that uh, point? First of all, I was gonna come in hot. Um, I was gonna I was gonna go full New York radio personality and tell you that Phil Jackson was right uh, and Chris Das Porzingis was a brat, but I decided to hold off. Uh, what I'd like to say, actually, is <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like to say. I, I always have these these ideas, and then I don't go through with them. But I think to the Noah point, that's an excellent point. And this is why it infuriates me more, because while being able to clear Tim Hardaway Jr.'s contract and Cornelius' contract is is in one trade is is objectively a good a good thing, uh, despite how terrible I think the trade was if there's one good thing from it it is that it's getting out from two contracts that were hampering you um, it made me think why couldn't they have just if they knew for a while that this was deteriorating which um, first of all this just goes to show you why I didn't buy into the culture bullshit because all year we heard how hard they were to patch things up and how you know how much better things were getting with Chris Stapps and oh we have this great open relationship we always talk to each other and then I uh, a trade doesn't come together 30 minutes after a meeting to go to Dallas. I'm sorry. So to me, that, that? That's, a, that's a fun thing. Like the Deandre Jordan thing was fun on Twitter. That's more, that was fun to make fun of and joke about, but that's very clearly ha- not how this played out. Yeah. And you know what, what, um, what gets me is so if you knew for a while and I'm going to speculate, it's been months um, that they knew my my thing is I think that they probably knew since right after media day, after they started meeting with him and he was back in New York. Um, I, I think they knew I, probably a, a month or so into the season. I think this all started uh, around the Frank Neal Kina, Dennis Smith Jr. trade talks. Um, I think they kind of got a bit of a feel for each other there and it just escalated. 
Kristaps is unhappiness with the franchise, though. That is old news. I mean, this is this is not new. This is certainly a breaking point. Now, so, so my point is, I think if you knew for a while that this was going to happen, and we could argue uh, it's semantics, but we can argue what a while technically means. Why were we in such a rush to buy out Joakim Noah? You mean to tell me there's not a team in the league that would have wanted Chris Stapps badly enough that they wouldn't have taken back Joakim Noah's contract, which expired next year? You know, like that that's something that really made me think, because it's like, well, now we don't have KP and we stretch Noah. And I know we have room technically for the two max slots now, and that's all fine and dandy and cool, but... um it just seems like it was a needless thing in hindsight now. And I, I just think for all the credit I was given Perry before, now it's starting to look a bit, little bit funny. You know, now now there's the, the, the Noah stretching situation, and now there's uh, moving Chris Stapps with his absolute lowest value. And it's just, uh, I think, I, I don't know. I think Noah and Chris Stapps can be looked a little bit more independently than we're giving them credit for right now. I think when Noah got stretched, I, I do not believe that uh, they had any intention on moving Chris Stops at that point. Maybe it's, not Maybe not moving is my point, but at, at that point, they knew something was up. Sure. You know, at, th- at that point, you look to go, okay, well, what happens if we have to trade him? Not we're actively looking for a trade, but let's start planning for, you know, what could happen in that scenario that that's what i mean well, i think they kind of knew the jig was up all right let's circle back to brian here real quick though because i i still want to get more of a grip on how he feels about the package that came back to the knicks i mean there's the first round picks are not you know it's not this year's pick obviously it's likely 2021 and 2023 um the uh there's an unprotected first round pick uh you know in 2021 and then there's a top 10 protection in 2023 um, but there's also the Dennis Smith piece. There's also these expiring contracts who we don't, we're not really sure if they'll stick around yet, but Brian, would you say the Knicks got fair value back in this trade? My very, 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 very hot take about this trade is you can't judge it independently without knowing what comes next. And there's a lot of different roads they can head down. Think think about the Carmelo Anthony trade with, and how we judged at the time versus how we look at it now because one of the pieces, the, the draft pick in that trade turned out to be Mitchell Robinson. That went from a decent trade that made sense to an unbelievable trade that it could help the franchise for a decade. Here's, so, here's, here's my one quick retort to that, Brian. Um, let's say you won the Mega Millions jackpot and you won... $250 million. You'd be pretty happy, right? Yeah. W- would you then stuff your car with the $250 million and then drive it back to the lottery folks and go, you know what? Thanks. I'm going to return all my winnings because I want two more lottery tickets. Would you do that? Or would you just be happy that you hit on something that is very impossibly difficult to hit on? And probably this is a wild analogy. And, and then probably <laughs> called it. You, you would not. Is my point. You would not. It's hard to hit in the lottery. <laughs> yeah, but we, we 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 know the majority of the time you fail. Like we, the majority of the time they're eh or worse. Like it doesn't work out often that the majority of the guys drafted work out statistically. We we know this. And for it to be a KP type, it's even less. So I don't. I, I'm not really fond of. Well, we got future picks. Well, those are. It's KP and Doncic over there. He's not leaving. He's going to stay there. I still you really know, don't the, know. The, I, I, their first round picks are going to be good. I mean, not good for us. Like they're going to be mid, mid first round picks, probably worse. Okay. I mean, it, so basically we're banking on hopefully they're worse. Hopefully KP walks. Hopefully those picks suck. And on top of all that, you know, Dennis Smith Jr. We hope that that turns into something because he's the only tangible piece moving forward that we got. Like that's a current player. Now, I know how Kyle feels about this whole situation because this is our second podcast in the last four hours that we've discussed this. Uh, but still, because Kyle continually grabs the mic at, right out of his hands, I don't quite know how Brian feels about this. I know he had a hot take about how he liked it. Uh, but right, tell me about these picks. Tell me tell me more about the picks. Like, do you... Because they could really be the make or, make or break in the deal, like you're saying. Like, what... Essentially, like, where would they need to place? Like, what would the Knicks 
you know, what, what makes these picks valuable, I guess, in the end? I think we're, I think you're looking at the picks wrong. If you're just look, looking at them through the prism of what they might be, the picks can be used in a variety of different ways. They could be used. So now you can trade a pick and you still have all your own picks, or if you trade your own pick you and you keep that pick. So it gives you, it's kind of what Boston did. And you, so that, that construct of the trade makes sense. And even the Suns, like they, they had a 2021 unprotected pick. They used that in conjunction with something else to get the 10th pick in the current draft in a draft. They moved up. They were able to move up like five picks because of that or four picks because of that. And one so thing there, no, there's, there's value in those picks, not just, and it's not just how, when it might convey to them. Well, on that point too, one thing that I it really frustrated me when the details first started coming out about you know the Knicks looking to trade Chris Sops Porzingis is that we're obviously a week away from the trade deadline, and you know this deal apparently just came out of the blue and apparated before their eyes to where there was a deal done with the Mavericks within 20 minutes. Um, but no, it, if, if you read the reporting on this, uh, Volkerov had in his story on The Athletic, they had seven or eight deals. They'd been talking to teams for a while. And after they talked to Porzingis today, they decided it was time to move on. So it's not just something that came out of the blue. It's something they've been working on and talking to people around the league about and i buy, I buy that i don't think a trade so, just up out of nowhere like but I, that. and i yes i agree with you too I'm, I'm being mostly facetious when i say that but like the one thing that i kind of started harping on is that if they knew they were going to move kp anyway you know anthony davis is still on the board he's still on the table like we were talking about this in the emergency pod earlier today but anthony davis is still on the table he's still on the table now like I don't understand why the Knicks wouldn't have made more of an effort to try, or maybe they did. Maybe the deal just wasn't there, but there, I, there, I get... was, a report, there was a report that the Pelicans didn't want Porzingis. Okay. Fair enough. But like, so Porzingis is gone. The Knicks now have two more first round picks. They have Dennis Smith Jr. Is there still any feasible construct for the Knicks to try to go after Anthony Davis at the trade deadline? No, there is there's no there's no rush for that anymore. The only reason to rush into a deal with Davis was so they could get the pick and Porzingis. They wouldn't have been able to do that in the offseason because Porzingis would have been a restricted free agent. Any other piece the Knicks are going to use in a Davis trade can be had after the trade deadline when they can let Boston get involved and create a bit of war. So it wouldn't make sense for the Pelicans to rush into a deal with the Knicks now. Yeah, I, I I am just, you know, it, it's you think you have an idea of where this team is going. I mean, all of us, you look at the three of us, you know, we do this twice a week. We're constantly plugged into this team. We're constantly plugged into, you know, what we have people telling us and what we you know read and what research we can do and what our eyes tell us even. And then it's, it's just it's wild that in an hour period, maybe a two hour span that it took to get that deal from like rumor to completion. It's just, it's all different. It's all changed. Here's an aspect that I don't, Kyle, that when you're talking about how cut and dry it is that it's dumb, that I also think you need to look at Porzingis himself. When he started these years, he's been, and he's played at his peak, he is absolutely an elite player. He's a big man who has a 57 pretty much true shooting percentage, can hit threes, protects the rim. And during those, and the Knicks have started those seasons off well. Him playing at that level is a big reason that both the last two years, he the one with Rose, they were like 17 and 14 or something like that. His rookie year, they even started off well. The last three years, they've started off before the season, they've started off okay, and then it's tailed off. And how he's played after those first two months has a big part to do with that. The highest true shooting percentage he's had in either December, January, February, or March of his career is 529, 52%, oh, just under 53%. Then it's 52%, 52%, just over 50%. That's very bad. And the Knicks have, uh, he, in those months, he's been a negative from 
comparing offensive rating to defensive rating. His offensive rating isn't higher than his defensive rating during any of those months. So there's significant question marks, not only about Porzingis and his knees and how being worried about how his body is built, but there's also worry about his stamina if he can put together those 82 games, not only just play them, but also play them at a very high level. And these are questions I had before they traded him. Like I, I put, I've thought about this and I've discussed this before. So this isn't new. That's also something you have to acknowledge when it comes to Porzingis, which makes this, I think a little bit more like the, the idea of dumping him. Now we can argue about what they got, but there is some merit to the idea of maybe this is getting out on high on him rather than selling low. There's just the, my, the, from the big picture perspective, I think you need to, is there's multiple avenues where you go from here. And this is what, before Kyle gave his analogy, this was the point that I was, I was going to make that you can't judge it right now because you have to see how it plays out. You have the best case scenario is the free agents come and that would be awesome. Your second scenario is say you miss out on the free agents. Will the Knicks have the discipline to actually KP was like, there was sort of a rebuild, but really they were trying to be good next year without him. Now, like, if they want to really rebuild this, they can. How did the Nets get D'Angelo Russell? They took on a bad contract and got a young asset in addition to that contract. So what the Knicks can do with that cap space if they miss on the big free agents is they can take on bad contracts, start to put together more young pieces on cheap deals for a, and get that from a team that wants to clear cap space just like the Knicks do. And then your third option is you do the thing where you sign the two good players, but not great players. And the positive in that is we get to watch decent basketball. The negative in that would be you're not good. You're most likely that's not, that's a harder path in my opinion to get to the championship level than either of the other two. That would be your worst case scenario and how this plays out. And it's hard to judge what they do here until we see how they take advantage of that cap space that they created today. So while I don't entirely disagree, because that's what a smart team would do, it begs the question is, are the Knicks then going to do that? Because I don't know. I, I, I'm a little bit concerned that um, the team basically had two years to transition and get away from the Phil Jackson era and fix things and plan and make things right. And, and I'm not saying it's all on them either, because I think for KP to be um, out on them and in the, in the direction of the team when he knew they were going to be bad without him. And I, I think I, I read that he wasn't showing up to some practices and not really being around the team as much as maybe he should. So I, it's not entirely on the Knicks thing either. I know I was very angry at the, uh, during my, you know, the first podcast, the emergency pod, but to me, I mean, KP is absolutely at blame as well. And um, I, I think knowing that and then seeing him tweet that little gif out of him, you know, high-fiving uh, Luka Doncic, I, I think it's just a little bit I, – I, I, and I never like to be that guy, but that, that, is, that is pretty classless. I don't I – don't, I don't like that, but um, well, you just went full blown New York sports fan. I, I did, I did, and and I said and I said some things like that in the emergency pod, and it's like you know I've never really felt that way, like the like the guy, and we always make fun of that kind of person, and I do, I rip them, I think it's hysterical, and and I really felt that way, today. and I was like, man, like I couldn't do this full time, like it took a a monumental event for this to happen today, where I'm just like, yeah, you know, I I get it, I get it now, like I I, I got in their heads, I see what it's like, I understand. Um, but I, I just don't, I don't trust them, you know? And, and that's the thing is you're basically waiting for the free agents or, um, for them to draft play, you know, to either draft players or use those picks to move up in a draft or acquire other assets. And I get all that, but you know, we've seen only what a year and a half of like 
regular competent basketball moves. I, I don't know that I trust them to be savvy with the picks, like you're saying, to to use them smartly and effectively. I think Perry's made a couple of nice little moves, but I don't know. Um, to me, I just, I'm just not as high on it, you know, and especially with the Mavericks maybe being very, very good going forward with keeping uh, a core of, of KP and, and Dodgich. I don't know that how, like those picks are going to change in value almost immediately. So I'm, I'm wary of how much they're going to, tr- I mean, first round picks are always valuable to a degree. I'm wary of how valuable they would actually be uh, when we go to do things again, it is good to have those, but um, at the end of the day, I just don't see given the situation here, you know, it, it doesn't speak well to their confidence when you have so much time to fix things with a very, very young player and you simply cannot do it. So I don't know that I trust them in the way you do, or I don't, I'm not saying you trust them, but it's like the plan you're laying out. I don't know that I trust them to do that. And I think it really is there, you know, they're depending on maybe a wink, wink deal or something to happen this summer the, or at the very worst, the following summer. I, I just don't, I just don't really have faith in them right now. I'm sorry. So, I, we have been hearing similar concerns from all of you uh, tonight as well, whether that's through Twitter where you're tagging the Knicks wall or all of us individually or all of you who have reached out to us over the course of today with, uh, you know, concern and care. We appreciate that very much. Um, we're going to listen to a couple of your voicemails that you left on the TKW voicemail line uh, in just a little bit. Before we do that, I want to ask you guys how it feels to uh, be without Tim Hardaway Jr. and Trey Burke and Courtney Lee, like these guys who were a part of the team for a little bit now. And Tim Hardaway Jr. obviously uh, was re-signed by this uh, this front office not too long ago, and you know made seventeen million dollars this year and next year and the following. Courtney Lee was on the books for twelve million next year. You know, obviously, the, all the talk of today is the Knicks have $74 million in cap space to spend this year. And we kind of talked about what they can do with that already. But just these individual pieces leaving the team, like, where, how do you guys feel about that? Because Hardaway really took over a, a, a really heavy scoring load for this team. And I'm just kind of, you know, they're not trying to win, but I'm just curious to see how they plan on replacing that, at least in the short term. I, I, I defended Timmy uh, for a while and I stand by it to this day uh, through all the comments and, and the hatred and, and the, I've had to persevere, you know, to be a, a Tim Hardaway defender. It's, it's been rough. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, not everyone's cut out for this job. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel, I feel good for Timmy. I, I think he's going to a better basketball situation. I, I think he's going to fit nicely next to Doncic, um, and uh, I'm just rooting for him. I know a lot of fans grew tired of him. I, I thought he did well, given the context that he's never supposed to be a number one option on the team. And I thought they generally looked, outside of a couple of games or a couple of stretches, um, I thought they generally looked really, really terrible without him out there offensively. Um, there's a lot of games where it was very noticeable when he missed that little stretch in December and, uh, the offense just needed a creator and it just wasn't enough without Timmy. And, um, the last thing I'll say is I'm just happy for his growth as a player. We drafted him and I always like the, the kids that we draft as we know from how sad we are with Chris stops today. And, uh, I wanted him to do well the first time he didn't and they moved him. He came back, and I thought, "Is he guaranteed from... another return at this point?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe you know, maybe. But I saw him compared to uh, he was called the Knicks Kirk Heinrich today. So I don't know. <laughs> if, yeah, that, 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 that I think it could happen. Listen, I I, I like him. I, I take him back not for that same contract, obviously, but I, I just I, I feel good about him as a player. I've always rooted for him. He's a good guy, a good kid, and uh, I think he's done a hell of a a hell of a job improving and becoming a, a really useful NBA player. So hopefully things go well for him in, in Dallas. So I, I know a lot of fans don't want to hear that maybe, or me root for anything in Dallas, but if anyone I'm wishing well there uh, today, it's, it really is Tim Hardaway. So Brian, do you have any parting thoughts on our uh, departed trio here? And, oh, last thing Cor- Courtney and Trey, I thought were just professionals through and through. 
given the situation. Uh, I, I'm glad that Trey has a little comeback here. And again, he was a pro, uh, even reading his comments when he was benched and relegated to uh, DNPs. So he was a pro, and I hope he sticks around wherever he ends up in Dallas or otherwise. And, and Courtney just, uh, I, I felt bad for him. He thought he was signing on for a, a playoff contending team to some degree next to Mello and um, didn't happen. And then he unfortunately had to take a back seat. So hopefully those guys just get whatever it is that they want at their next destination, whether it's Dallas or otherwise. So now, Brian, do you have any parting thoughts for our departing trio here? I, I'm not just not going to be repetitive. I pretty much agreed exactly with what Kyle just said. So I won't repeat the same exact thing. That's useless. Okay, so we are going to turn to a couple of voicemails that you have graciously left for us on the TKW voicemail line. Uh, this first one comes from a man with a great first name, Anthony D'Italiano. Let's listen in. Well, hey, y'all. This is Anthony D'Italiano on Twitter. A lot of emotions going on right now. It's quite the afternoon. As much as the reaction is to be mad at the Knicks, as always, I mean, how can you be in this point? They're they're doing the right thing for the first time in a decade or two. They're not doing anything, haven't done anything stupid. They're trying to move, trying to move cap space. They're lining up to have a great pick. They're playing the young guys. They have a progressive coach who seems to be motivating everybody out there. You know, getting them on the same page despite the losing, and our supposed unicorn franchise player goes and burns the whole house down while he's still sitting inside it. So he mentioned something about the, uh, you know, the Knicks have a in position for a great pick. You know, they're going to be playing the young guys more and that's going to put them in a better position for that pick. And obviously, you know, that's probably going to come with more losses. He also mentioned Fisdale being a progressive coach. Uh, That's kind of where I want to sit on right now too. After all this with KP gone, you know, the front office not necessarily being at their most trustworthy. We voiced some concerns about Fisdale up until this point. Uh, so, I don't know. In the wake of all of this, do you, does does any of this have an impact on how you view Fisdale? Should he be doing anything differently for the rest of the year now that KP is definitely not coming back? No, just because he just had down the path he's been the last couple weeks. And uh, I'm excited to watch my bad Knicks in peace with no one caring about them. And there's a group of players. Now, here's the thing, though. Say they don't buy out Wesley Matthews and DeAndre Jordan. You're basically taking Trey Burke and Courtney Lee and Enos, whatever minutes were left over from Enos Cantor, and you're probably moving Vonley back to the four, splitting center minutes between Mitchell Robinson and DeAndre Jordan, adding Wesley Matthews to your wing rotation. They're a better team than they were. Yeah, but how much though? Honestly, like how many like, how many wins is, is Dennis Smith Jr., uh, Wes Matthews, and DeAndre Jordan going to net you right now? More than they've been winning, like not losing. But they can, they can win too. Like I'm not if if you're telling me the Knicks are you know adding them to the team means the Knicks are going to win like three games for the rest of the season. I'm all for that. I don't know how many, but I think they're a better team with these guys. Well, let's let's look at what, what the roster looks like right now, like all together. I just want to read this out. Uh, so they have DeAndre Jordan, they have Mitchell Robinson, they have Luke Cornett, and they have Cantor all at the five position right now. You could argue some of these positions around for a few guys, but just kind of traditionally, uh, you got Bonley, you got Lance, you have Isaiah Hicks at the four, you got Knox and Hazonia at the three. You have Dotson, Trier, and Matthews at the two. And then Dennis Smith Jr., Frank Nielakina, Emmanuel Moutier, and Kadeem Allen playing the one. All these positions are relatively interchangeable. I mean, we all know this watching the NBA for the last few years. But uh, really interested to see especially how this guard rotation ends up shaking out uh, after this trade. Um, can I interrupt you guys for a a more breaking thing that happened. Go. 
So what Sam, the fuck now? Well, so, well, well, hold on, hold on. Like it's I'm not sorry, like a transaction. I'm, I'm, okay, I, I, I know. I'm sorry. So Sam, Amic, is it Amic or Amic? Amic. Amic. Okay. I think I don't know. I'm just making it. Yeah, okay. it, it doesn't matter. He just uh, put a story out for the Athletic that said KD and Kyrie to NYC. Why execs around the NBA think the Porzingis trade makes it more possible than ever. Um. So I am skimming through it right now. Why are you for... doing this to me? Huh? Why are you doing this to me? I am reading important news to be as topical as possible because God knows by the time we release this, five other reports are going to drop and this is going to be irrelevant. So let me have this. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you really, you're talking yourself into this already. I love it. So apparently the translation from the opposing GMs is it's left everyone thinking, what do they know that we don't? And I think I, I don't know how you give the Knicks that benefit of the doubt. Like Jalen Rose went on TV and right when the Knicks dumped all those contracts and I'll never forget him going on and being like, yeah, the Knicks are now getting LeBron and another player, LeBron and Bosch or LeBron and Wade. I forget whichever one he said. And yeah, no one knows if the Knicks are getting anything oh. right. So so here's this. It says, add in the growing concern from rival teams that the Knicks will offer uh, Kleiman, who is Durant's agent, a job as part of their plan. And the fact that Durant and Perry are known to still have a good relationship, and you have to understand why New York had everyone's attention even before this monumental move. But if this truly is in the works, if Durant is planning to bounce from the Bay and take on the Yeomans Challenge, did I enunciate that correctly? I've never said that word out loud. I've never. I, so. I don't know what you're talking about. The what challenge? Yeoman. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I think Y Y E O M A N apostrophe S. That's a new word for me. Yeah, I know the word. I'm I'm ninety. That one I'm ninety nine percent sure I said right. So the Yeoman's challenge of bringing back glory to the garden. It's just the sort of thing that will keep the Boston Celtics Express up at night from until uh, from now until the summer. And then he goes on to explain a little more. So if you guys have any thoughts on that, I'm going to skim for other things. My thoughts are that is very clearly the dream and hopefully it happens, but I'm not going to believe it will happen until it happens. I have no thoughts on it. How about we get back to some voicemails? (laughs) Salty (laughs) hubs. Okay. This next voicemail comes from Tom in Connecticut. I think it's, uh, goes without saying that me as a Knicks fan and probably most Knicks fans in general are absolutely devastated. I think that this was a rush decision, uh, except for the fact if you look at uh, the gift that they keep playing of uh, Luca and KP last night and the smirks and the exchange. Looks like he said, save me a seat or save me a spot or something, uh, potentially referencing the plane or the bench or whatever. Maybe this was in the works uh, because he wants to play with Luca. Uh Absolutely ridiculous. I think the hall is not nearly enough. I don't want Dennis Smith Jr. We've been hating him ever since we didn't take him. And now we have potentially given up Trey Burke. It's unclear. Sham said we gave up Trey Burke and got back a first-round pick, which makes it slightly better. But uh, other than that, I don't even know who I'm rooting for anymore. I liked Hardaway, although I knew he was potentially not long for this team. And it is just absolutely devastating. I'm going to be a Mavs fan, I think. Tom has mentioned that uh, he he doesn't want Dennis Smith Jr. and that we as a collective fan base have been hating him uh, ever since we didn't take him, which I I, I don't think I could necessarily disagree with that. I'm pretty sure uh, I don't think Knicks fans have had a single good thing to say about Dennis Smith Jr. And I think, and I was mentioning this to, to Kyle earlier, Brian, but I think that Dennis Smith Jr. ending up on the Knicks is just an act of God. I think it's just destiny at this point. I think he was always supposed to be here. We haven't st- you know, stopped talking about him since the draft in 2017. Like This was meant to happen, and I think it's just some kind of curse that we had to give up KP for it to happen. I'm excited to watch him and uh, to watch Dennis and Frank together. I think it'll be fun. He is a good asset. Like you know, We give him a lot of shit, and obviously it doesn't help that we traded Kristaps Porzingis for him, essentially. But I... I I am excited to see how he plays. I mean, he had a triple double last night against the Knicks, but uh, it, and you know he looked, he put up his career high in assists and everything like that. So 
I mean, there's a lot to lot to glean from him. I just, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this point guard rotation pans out. You know, considering now you've got Dennis Smith, Neil Kina, Moody A, uh, all in the mix here. It's, and if they stick with either the five out offense using Cornette or Bomley at center or using Mitch, Mitchell Robinson as the vertical threat, you've got that, that this offense and how they do and how they run it with the pick and roll and the dribble handoffs, it fits Dennis Smith's skill set very well. Like Fisdale wants guards who can create for themselves and go to the rim. Dennis Smith Jr. is going to be able to do that. I think and well at what Moutier does, but Moutier can't finish when he gets to the rim or does not isn't that great with his handle and can't get all the way there, so he has to settle for mid-range jumpers. Dennis Smith, when he has that space in the middle, is going to explode to the rim. I'm excited to watch it. I am too. I, th- I really do think that he's an improving young player. And we do this, and I've said it on this pod and, and on Twitter before, but, um, you know, we do this thing where we always rush to judge young players immediately. And then whatever stance we came up with, that's the stance and that's it. You know, it happened with Devin Booker last year. Well, he's just a scorer. That's it. He, he stinks. You know, that's it. Empty stats. And it's like, well, why do we do that? And this year he's been better. You know, it's like, why do we always rush? You know, I, he, he had a pretty good first season in Dallas. He obviously had his flaws. You know, I, I think he's taken strides despite being demoted this year. And I think that speaks to being able to fit into a system, even if he wasn't happy about it, as we know. Um, so I think maybe what he's learned in the half season playing off ball, he's going to use, I, I think being able to initiate an offense again, he's going to be better at it now. So um, and, and to your point about Moutier, someone sent us like a comparison about him and Moutier and um, how Moody st- the, the stats are similar, right? Moutier edges him out in a couple of things. But to me, it's like, well, yeah, I'd rather have done this with Junior. He's younger. He's way more explosive. And if he's already better than Moutier now, then, okay, let's move Moutier somewhere. So he's shooting 34% from three this year. That's already a significant difference for Moutier. You know, so it's like he's going to be able to shoot. Um, I think he's trending that way and developing that way. And he, even if he did shoot 34, 35 percent, I mean, that's still respectable. You're going to have to guard him out there. That's not a shitty three point percentage. So um, I, I just I, I kind of believe in it a little bit. Um, and I talked about this with the Frank uh, Dennis Smith Jr. pod we did a couple of weeks ago, but. I love Frank, but you need someone who's going to be able to actually initiate and, and get into the pain and, and take advantage. And I think Dennis Smith is that. they're going to do with Frank. I saw a couple of things. I mentioned it in the emergency pod uh, about Frank maybe getting moved or people interested in him and kind of, the, you know, the, the vultures are lurking okay, now. So start him, but start them, my starting backcourts, Dennis Smith, start Jr. them together. And um, I'd probably throw Dotson at the three Bonley at the four and Mitchell at the five. And Oh, no, nah, I'm missing Knox. I, I would put Knox at the three and Dotson mm. off the bench there. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. I'm interested. To, I, I have a feeling that Dotson's going to move into the starting lineup. I like Dotson in the starting lineup as a balance. I Vonley off the bench. And this is why you need Jordan out of there. Right. There, is, there just doesn't seem to be a fit for him. You know, and, and, and Matthews, too. I mean, there's depending on either one of those guys sticking around, it's just going to eat up the minutes that we're trying to desperately free up for these guys at this point. Yeah, I'm with you. I think I think it makes the most sense to buy them out or see you use this week's. Maybe you can get a second round pick for one of them in yeah. exchange for another expiring contract. But for the most part, there's this you want to give these guys time like you can. The point guard minutes should be going to Dennis and Frank. The two, three minutes should be going to Trier, Dotson, Knox. Knox. The three, four minutes should be going to Von Ley, Knox. The center minutes, you got Mitch, Bonley, and Cornette, who sounds like he's going to be back on Friday. Don't, don't forget any... about, yeah, Kroby. 
can't forget about Hazonia. Oh, I don't care about him. <laughs> you don't think he's earned some minutes the last couple of weeks? The last oh, couple I of games? He's been fine, but I don't care. Like no. he's he's of no he's of no consequence. Wow. Him. Can you all right, think about this, man. Twenty uh twenty fifteen draft. We're now like what, three and a half years out from it? Can you imagine that if I told you at the time we would no longer have Chris Stops on the roster, but we would have Mario Hazonia and Emmanuel Moutier? <laughs> it's incredible. All right. That's funny. Let, well, hey, we got another small point guard that's going to win the dunk contest. Yeah, that this will be our saving grace. At least we have some representation in All Star Weekend now. Like yeah, we didn't have we don't have Knox or or uh, you know Neil Aquina in the uh, in the Rising Star game or anything. We obviously don't have any All Stars this year. Um, so yeah, I mean Dennis Smith Jr. once a Nick, always a Nick, soon to be a Nick, will be uh, dunking for us. But all right, well, this is far. I I literally I would talk longer, but I physically don't think I can about Chris Stops and the Knicks and how sad I am. Why don't we end this podcast here with a uh, quick memory? Maybe g- give me a, uh, do we, do we have a favorite Chris Ops memory we could each pull out and drop on the pod right now? I can Ooh. start, I could start us off. There was a game in his rookie season. Uh, it, it had to be before Christmas, but it was against Charlotte. It was that one where he hit the game winning three, like right, right uh, after the buzzer had sounded. And I just remember like, having my phone out, like filming it at that moment and then just freaking out the set. Like as soon as he hit it and then, you know, it got, it got reversed. It didn't end up going their way, but still like it, it I mean, still, I just remember like that was a moment where I said him where I'm like, this dude's going to be electric and it's going to be great for years to come. And it just seems to be uprooted now. You guys have a memory. The, the stretch of play he had to start last season was the best stretch of play from a Knicks player probably since Mello in 14, in 13, 14, when he went crazy. He had, he had a, like around the time Mello had the 62 point game. I think he stacked like a bunch of games back to back to back. And that was the highest level we've gotten. Uh, Chris Dops to start last year was the highest level you got to see a Knicks player play in a very long time, and that was enjoyable. Um, mine was I wasn't really high on KP um, when oh, he was drafted. Dude, I I wanted his own, no question. Mm. I wanted Justice Winslow really, really badly, and if I couldn't get him, I wanted Moutier. So I guess I deserve this hell that we're in now. But um, I wasn't high on him, and I. That I think it was that game against the Hawks when he when he played the passing lane and, and uh, yes. I think he went behind the back on Millsap, I believe it was or Horford. He went behind the back uh, with his left hand. Back it's the best play right. of his career. It, it, and, it's the best play of his career. That was well, fucking well, insane. To, to me, that's when I was like, you know what? Um, he, he's he's gonna be special. Like the, he was so gangly and and. Had it, I mean, he still hasn't fully grown to his body, but at that time it was it was just drastic. And uh, to see him make like a play like that, and, and and he was quick about it, you know. And that's the right right then I was like, he's gonna be, he's gonna be very very good, uh, very very good. He has length and the athleticism, and he uses it. And and I saw it all in that one play uh, as a gangly teenager. So it's, I think that's what bothers me the most is homegrown talent is always the thing that you want, you know, even, even the season, that's been the big theme, you know, everybody's been sad, you know, don't trade any of these pieces away. These are our kids the, you know, we, we got to follow that model and hopefully these guys pan out. And I asked for happy memories at the end. And this is what you give me. It is a happy memory. Yeah. I mean, it started I, happy and then you transitioned yeah. to be salty again. No, no, it's not salty. I'm just saying like, Oh, you sound a little mad. It, it, no, no, it's not that. I'm privacy. That part wasn't mad. That part was strictly, you know, you, you want to always root for the kids, and and to see any of them leave, especially in, in a fashion like this, when when you thought the era was really going to get started, it, it is it is sad. And I I really I, I'm not going to. There's a lot of angry angry Knicks fans. I know Knicks Reddit, uh, Reddit is a mess. Uh, Knicks Twitter has been a mess. I'm not going to 
wish him anything poor. I, I've seen some nasty things, as I'm sure you guys know. But I, I, I hope he has a good career. I don't wish him any anything bad. I just that this whole situation just sucks, and I feel like we kind of got robbed of that feeling of seeing somebody grow up and have a really great career with one organization, at least for a majority of their career. And I thought we, I thought we had that is my point. So and that for w- it to not happen is, is sad. That was Kyle Maggio's happy note to close this whole out on. Um, we'll be here for you guys though. I mean, we're, we're not going anywhere. You know, I send all the links earlier. You can follow all of us on Twitter, you can follow the Knicks wall. You could uh, subscribe on YouTube. You could do all of those things. I think there'll be some Twitch play going on tonight too, but you know that'll be done by the time this pod is out. So never mind. But uh, you know, Kristaps is gone, but we're not, and we're gonna get you through the rest of the season. And uh, yeah, we'll see what comes after that, right? All right, guys. Well, for this special edition of the TKW podcast, we uh, will talk to you all soon. Another, another.